Good morning. My name is Billy Waters, and I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to welcome everybody as we have come to worship one name, and that's the name that is above every name, King Jesus. Uh, and if this is your first time, when I want to I give out a special welcome to you. Super grateful that you're here, whether you're in person or online. We do want to get to know you better. There's a connection booth out in the foyer there. We'd love for you to fill out some information. This is a good way for us to get to know you. Also, there is a connection card. We have a church center app that you can fill out your information, and we will reach out to you through that. But again, um, this is just a way that we could uh, just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, And we have come together again for one purpose, and that's to worship Jesus. And, uh, you know, as the the scripture reading was read, you know, we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians through a series, and uh, the reason why we took out one of the songs is this is going to be a little bit longer of a sermon, just the nature of it. Um, There's going to be a lot of quotes. Some of them will be up on the screen. Some of them won't be. Um, And as I was thinking about just even preparing this and preaching this, just recognize there might be some different people from different places. First of all, if this is your first time here, and uh, I just trust the sovereignty of the Lord has brought you for such a time as this, I don't know. Um, If you're new to Christianity, you might have said to yourself, I've heard there's passages like this in the Bible, and there it is. Um, For others who knew about 1 Corinthians 11, you knew this day was going to come. Some others might be saying, why do we have to speak about this at all? Why do we have to bring this up in the church? And the answer is because it's in the Bible. And when we do this series, when we go through books of the Bible, which is what we tend to do, um, when we hit passages like this, we don't skirt them. We we embrace them and uh, work through these challenging passages. And then there might be other people that say, why don't we preach on this more? And the answer is the same as I just said. I mean, we, we go through books of the Bible, and we emphasize the things that the Scriptures emphasize. And so every Sunday, we'll be preaching on Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Why do we do that? Because it's on every page of the Scriptures. And when we get to difficult passages like this, again, we embrace them. But we don't hammer on them every Sunday because they're not on every page of the Bible, like when we talk about like, the nature of Christ and who Jesus is and the power of the Spirit working in his church. Um, so we're going to uh, engage this passage here this morning. Now, recognizing this is a challenging passage, what I did was is gather together all of our women's staff, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm a male, <laughs> I'm a man, um, and I'm going to be preaching this passage. What is important for me to know is a male preacher preaching this passage? And there was, I don't know, maybe 12 to 14 women staff. And here's some of the things that they shared, and I want to share them with you guys. I have to continually submit this passage and passages like this to the Lord. Sometimes I struggle with the Lord. Lord, why did you make me a woman? You look at all of history and you see how women have been treated, and it's awful. And much of it has been done in the light of passages like this. It is super challenging for me to understand what is cultural and what is universal. What I need you to know as a male preacher, just as we need you to come to the text with humility, we need to do the same. This is hard to understand. I trust and love the Lord, but this doesn't make sense. I have a lot of feelings when it comes to these passages, when it comes to how I was raised in an abusive hierarchical society that happened at the hands of the church. I read this passage, and I read that I was created simply to make the man's life better. And he has complete control over my life. Complementarian is a word that to me means abuse. We are used to being told that this is not a primary issue, which is easy, very easy for a man to say, but it affects women very differently. I understand that we are saying when we call it secondary issue, but it feels like telling a black person in the United States that racism is secondary. We get to say that because we're white and the intent might be good, but it is still very painful. There's language piece here that is so sensitive indeed. How does this look for a single woman going through the credentialing process and seeing priests and bishops above me has felt healthy. Truly seeing our community as family is very helpful. Seeing those women use it well, I'm sorry, seeing those men use it well has been healing and healthy. I see the other men on staff as brothers as well. So that's just some of the things that were shared, and I'm going to mention some other pieces as well. But here's my ask as we embrace this text. First, let's wrestle through this text together, and then love each other when we're done. That's my ask. We're going to go through this passage. We're going to be looking at the text itself and then drawing out five principles. 
In the words of Craig Blomberg, this passage is probably the most complex, controversial, and opaque of any text of comparable length in the New Testament. So in light of that, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we come before you in humility. As a church, we submit ourselves underneath your word. We don't pick apart your word, your word picks apart us. And when it crosses our cultural sensibilities, we just submit everything to you, Lord. And more than anything, Jesus, we want to know your truth because we recognize your truth sets us free. So as a church, may we live under your truth with your grace and mercy. By the power of your spirit, we cannot do this in our own strength. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. All right. 1 Corinthians 11, verse, we're going to walk right through it, <clears throat> verses 2 and 3. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And we're off. Okay, a couple observations. First is, um, is this talking about husbands and wives? Is this talking about leadership within the church? I would lean towards um, leadership within the church. Uh, marriage is um, more clearly defined within Ephesians 5, but I believe that this leans more into the church. There could be an argument made, especially from verse 7, that this is referring to husbands and wives. Um, again, I would lean because this is a letter to the church, the church of Corinth. It is speaking to the church. And it is recognizing that what is going to be said here is a gift that is to be given, not a demand that is to be taken, taken and under certain gospel parameters. In other words, this is in the context of the church. Second observation is this definition of headship, because this is the word that this whole passage revolves around. Because I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and um, the head of Christ is God. What is the definition, or how do we understand this headship? There are four different um, takes on this word head. There are two primary. Out of the four commentary, uh, commentators that I respect, Keener, Schreiner, Blomberg, and Fee, two go one way, two go the other. <laughs> For two of them, they will say that this word means source. So Eve literally came from Adam. So Adam is the source, so therefore he is the head, therefore representative of. And you have certain passages that would lean in that direction. Say, for example, Colossians 2. They have lost connection with the head, there's the word, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes them to grow. Another definition was, would be that headship means authority. And that is also in other passages of Scripture. So, for example, in Ephesians 1, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him, that is Christ, to be head over everything for the church. It's not only communicating source, but it's also communi communicating authority, that Christ is, has authority. Uh, Colossians 1, And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So you have in that passage, he's the firstborn from among the dead. That is, you know, he was a co-eternal with the Father, um, but he is the first in the sense of dying on the cross and then being raised to create a new humanity, but he is supreme overall. So in that sense, authority is communicated within the word. Now, I would lean towards authority. I would lean towards this word communicating a sense of authority. But what is primary to understand is the dynamic that Paul is communicating because the focus is the relationship between God and the church. And that is analogous that, that, that frames the whole passage. How we understand this passage is in light of God's relationship with Christ. In the words of one female leader in that session that we had, she said, I have been really impacted by verse 3. The head of Christ is God. Their relationship is not domineering. So we look at the relationship between the Father and the Son, and it is beautiful. Paul is brilliant. He is trying to entangle every place that the, the he is sorry. He is trying to untangle every place that the church has touched. This whole domination thing is not even a part of the story. So in light of that image, you look at the Father's relationship with the Son, and what is that? 
It's deep unity in the Trinity. There's inseparable in operation. That is that there's one will, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Father, the Father is the fountainhead of all love, grace, honor. And he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He is eternally gracious, eternally good. He is infinite in his glory, light, and love. And all of that is being showered down upon the Son. And what is the son's role in his incarnation but to receive the father's honor, receive the father's love, receive the father's dignity, and then spread that in the work and the ministry that he engaged in. So there's the father's headship, but then there's also the son's submission. The submission is receiving what the father is doting on upon him. In the words of Tom Schreiner, the point is not that the son is essentially inferior to the father. Rather, the son willingly submits himself to the father's authority. The difference between the members of the Trinity is a functional one, not an essential one. And probably the scripture that highlights this really, really well is in the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. For he has put everything under his feet. That is the father putting everything under the son's feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, that is Christ, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. So there you have um, unity, but there's, there's a functional difference there. So that's where I would lean in regards to headship, primarily recognizing that there is authority within it, but also primarily looking at the relationship between the Father and the Son that frames this entire passage, verses 4 through 6. For if a woman woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is... But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her hair shaved, then she should cover her. Her head. Now, some would say, obviously, this is a cultural statement. Some have said that because head coverings are cultural, then this passage, this entire passage, is irrelevant for today. And the problem that I see with that statement is that in addition to the cultural symbol that's being communicated, we also have a theological reality of God's relationship between Christ and the Heavenly Father. And that's analogous to men and women in the context of the church. But head coverings is absolutely a cultural sign of authority. Men don't have it, but the women do. But it's a cultural artifact. And I want to highlight a couple observations about this. In verse 4, it says, Every man who prays and prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. A couple observations. First, the woman is praying and prophesying. So what Paul is coming against is not the fact that she's doing it, but how she's doing it. And to pray and prophesy in the context of a corporate gathering, especially to prophesy, is to have spirit-filled preaching. So there's a gift that's being expressed in the body of Christ by the women that's received for the purpose of building up the body. Second observation is, is that the men don't have a covering, but the women do. Now, that's partly, I mean, it's, it's, it's a symbol, it's an artifact of what's happening in the dynamic that's taking place, but it's also pointing to the fact that men in the ancient Near East, when they had their head covered, it signaled the cultural elite or pagan worship. For a woman not to have her head covered in this kind of a gathering oftentimes would communicate either sexual or religious unfaithfulness. And so Paul, in the attempt to honor And bring about equality for men and women, he's saying, you need to do this. This is in the words of Cynthia Westfall. The veil that we've just been talking about, the veil served to differentiate between respectable women and those who were publicly available. That is, use of the veil classified women according to their sexual activity and signaled to men which women were under male protection and which were fair game. Paul's support of all women veiling equalized the social relationships in the community. Inasmuch as such veiling was in his control, he secured respect, honor, and sexual purity for women in the church who were denied that status in culture. What she's saying is that the reason why Paul is doing this is for the purpose of honoring, protecting, specifically those who would have been normally taken advantage of, And also dignifying those of a lower class and to keep the focus on glorifying Jesus, not on the dress of a particular person. So that was the purpose of it. Verse 7. 
A man, not, um, a man ought to not cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but women, woman is the glory of man. That's the passage that I would tip toward husband and wife. It seems that that's what's going on here. Now, the question is, is woman made in the glory of God? Absolutely. It's like there's a double glory happening. Women are made in the image of God. Men are made in the image of God. And there's, just a, there, there's a double glory taking place here. Keep going. Verses 8 and 9. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. We're going to come back to that in one of the implications, because that's absolutely significant, because we need to ask the question, for what purpose? And we'll get to that in just a second, because it's hearkening back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over his own head because of the angels. Okay, that's clear. Uh, <laughs> You know, Peter said some of the things that Paul writes are difficult to understand. <laughs> I think he's referring to this passage right here. You know, I'm like 51% sure that this is maybe even 49% sure this is what's happening. I think it's hearkening back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which is because of the angels. Don't you know you'll be judging the angels? In other words, if we're going to have a right order in the context of a worship service, um, we're able to judge these things in a right way because, I mean, we're going to be judging angels. So we've got to get this thing figured out and talk about it for the purpose of glorifying King Jesus and serving and sacrificing each other for one another. Okay. Verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not ind in independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. And this is the great statement of interdependence. If a person reading up till now is going to be leaning in one direction, Paul makes crystal clear. There is mutuality. There is equality within the people of God. There's an interdependence that takes place between the people of God. There's an irreducible equality and dignity between male and female. That woman came from man, but also man came from woman. Every man born has come from woman. And every woman born has also come from woman. So there's an interdependence there that Paul is communicating. And lastly, verses 13 through 16. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray, there it is, to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Now again, he's... he's calling out a cultural symbol with long hair. And what he's communicating here is that there is a cultural symbol in, in a way that is appropriate according to the two genders and the ways that we reflect the image and the glory of God, two ways, male and female, because both genders have been created in the image of God. But these gender distinctives are important and need to be reflected in a culturally appropriate way. So if I'm in Scotland... It's very appropriate for me to wear a kilt. However, if I was to come in here this morning and wear a blouse or a skirt, it would, it would cue off certain cultural understandings. And so it's very appropriate recognizing that there are gender distinctives. That's the principle. And that culturally speaking, that there are ways to signal those gender distinctives. That is important for us to consider. This is what Paul's saying. Okay, so that's the text. What I want to draw out is five principles from this passage. First, gifts are not gender specific. As we see in this passage, women are praying and prophesying, and they're taking positions of leadership within the church. As I said, when they're prophesying, that is spirit-filled teaching in the corporate gathering. And you look at the Old Testament, you have Deborah leading an entire nation, you have Esther saving the people of God from the Persian Empire, or from Haman, specifically. You also have uh, um, um, Miriam, who leads the people of God, who prophesies. In the New Testament, you have women who are followers of Jesus, women who are benefactors in Luke chapter 8, uh, Mary Magdalene and um, Joanna are benefactors for the ministry of Jesus. Sermon on the Mount brought to you by Mary of Magdalene. 
parable of the prodigal son brought to you by Susanna. They were benefactors and leaders within the early church. Also, they were not only the first to know about the incarnation, they're also the ones who were at the cross and also John. And they were the first to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which meant that the women who in that day did not have a proper standing in regards to a witnesses, the Lord used them as witnesses to validate the resurrection of Christ and to communicate that to the disciples. Furthermore, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. One of the most compelling passages is for me is Acts chapter 2, where it says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. There it is. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days. So men and women are going to be called not only to fulfill the the creational mandate to fill the earth and populate it, but also to fulfill the great commission, men and women together. Also, you have early church leaders like Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church, and the four places where the spiritual gifts are listed, it does not say, these are for men, these are for women. These gifts are given to the body of Christ for the purpose of building up the body of Christ and glorifying King Jesus. Now, how does that get expressed here at Wellspring? Okay. Katie is the executive pastor of ministry. (laughs) She has a place of high leadership within this community. She preaches I don't know, like eight or so times a year. Tara leads our catechism class, which is the primary discipleship for adults as they go um, before the confirmation service with the bishop. We believe that women need to be, have expression in leadership at the church. Out of our staff, 14 out of our 23 um, leaders are women and on our board we have men and women represented. We, we, we don't believe in an over-feminized nor an over-masculinized masculinized church. <laughs> All right, that's the first point. Point two, gifts are not gender specific. Number two leads into this. Both genders are equally and essential for the creational mandate and the Great Commission. Now, going back to verses 8 and 9, I skipped it for a good reason, because I want to go back to it in, the, in this implication. It says, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, you think that that's, you know, Paul, what are you talking about here? We have to ask the question, for what purpose? Because he's hearkening back to Genesis 1 and 2. And it's in that passage that Adam was alone. He had the creational mandate to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over creation. Question, how can Adam, who's not a hermaphrodite, fulfill the creational mandate? He can't. So God says, I'm going to create a helper, an ezer. And in that word, it's not just like a helper who helps out, you know, around the house or something. That is a strong word. It's most often used of God himself. When a person can't do the thing that God had called them to do, you put a position in power, a, a person that comes alongside, a position of power and authority to help them to fulfill the purpose. So what's being communicated here is, is that man and woman together are coming together for the purpose of fulfilling the creational mandate. And not only the creational mandate, but also the great commission of going out into the world and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both are equally and essentially needed. One isn't less than the other. Uh, Beth, how many people have done a Beth Moore study? Okay, number B. This is her quote. And how she's experienced the evangelical church in recent, well, in fact, her entire life. And how her, it's been... Um, perceived as her gifts being lesser than. She says, As a woman leader in the conservative evangelical world, I learned early to show constant pronounced deference, not just proper respect, which I was glad to show, to male leaders, and when placed in situations to serve alongside of them, to do so apologetically. I issued disclaimers ad nauseum. I wore flats instead of heels when I knew I'd be serving alongside a man of shorter stature so I wouldn't be taller than he. I've ridden elevators and hotels packed with fellow leaders who were serving at the same event and not been spoken to, and even more awkwardly, in the same vehicles where I was never acknowledged. I've been in a team meetings where I was either ignored or made fun of, the latter of which I was expected to understand was all in good fun. Now, I'm a laugher. I can take jokes and make jokes. I know good fun when I'm having it, and I also know when I'm being dismissed and ridiculed. I was an elephant in the room with a skirt on. I've been talked down to by males, seminary students, 
And I held my tongue when I wanted to say, brother, I was getting up before dawn to pray and pour over the scriptures when you were still in your pull-ups. <laughs> Here's the point. There's no second-class gifts and there's no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Gifts are not only not gender-specific, but also both genders are equally essential for the creational mandate and the Great Commission. Okay, third, gender differences are God-created and good. What's being reflected here is that the recognition that there are two genders that God creates in his image, and they are good. Two genders that are not just anatomically different, but there's emotionally different, relationally different, psychologically different, and physically different that we need to acknowledge. Yes, equal, but different. And there are culturally appropriate ways to express gender. Kevin DeYoung says, far from being a cultural construct, God depicts the existence of a man and a woman as essential to his creational plan. The two are neither identical nor interchangeable. And these gender differences are not a part of the fall. They're a part of creation. They're good. These gender differences are good, and we need to uphold them. John Tyson uses an illustration. He says, like, if, if you're just, like, let's say you're in a room, and you have, like, ten guys and they're shooting the breeze. And you have one other guy enter into the room. Not much changes. In fact, there's just kind of an addition of whatever's going on there. However, if you have 10 guys that are shooting the breeze in the room, and all of a sudden you have a female, a woman come in, it changes the dynamic of what's going on there. And what he says is the two genders together, there's something that is restrained and released to reflect the glory of God. Something restrained. The guys will then watch their tongue. But there's also something that's beautiful released in the midst of that. And I think, I don't know, when there's 10 women together, if you add another woman, there's a great thing going on there. But as soon as you add a man, there is something restrained and something that's released that is good. And it reflects the glory of God. So gender distinctives are important. Number four, fourth implication. Paul's approach to ministry is both equality with headship. Equality with headship. First, it is equality. Verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. They go together. There's, there's an equality there. There's an irreducible dignity and value to both genders. And this has always been the case, not only scripturally, but also historically in the church. In fact, this is one of the key dynamics that got Christianity so much PR in the first few centuries. And now I'm, I'm quoting Peter Lightheart quoting Rodney Stark. I'm trying to do due diligence with my, you know, ascribing appropriate sources. Okay, this is what one or both of them say. What historians will say that from the beginning, Christianity elevated women to a place of dignity and equality. Women found the early church attractive because, as Roddy Stark says, Christian women enjoyed considerably greater status and power than pagan women, both in the home and the church. The church prohibited infanticide and so prohibited female infanticide. Christian teachers condemned divorce and sexual sins and destroyed the pagan double standards by demanding that men as well as women be chaste before marriage and faithful in marriage. Pagan widows were pressured to remarry, but in the church, widowhood was highly respected. Wealthy widows kept their husbands' estates, and the church cared for poor widows. Christian widows had more options than their pagan counterparts. Within the church, women served as deacons and deaconesses in all these ways. The Christian women enjoyed far greater marital security and equality than their, the, did their pagan neighbor. So many women joined the church that in 370, the Emperor Valentinian issued a written order to Pope Damasius I requiring that Christian missionaries cease calling at the home of pagan women because of the way the church honored and dignified women. Imago Dei. Equality with headship. That's how I understand Paul. Headship, verse 3, as I mentioned earlier, verse 3 frames the whole thing. And there's a dignity in this. Because when we look at the, at the image that is being given here in Scripture, 
that man is the head of woman, even as God is the head of Christ, we have to look at the nature of how the father interacts with the son and able to understand all other dynamics. That's the guiding paradigm and motif for the whole passage. And we can't get around it. That's what drives the whole thing. And so again, how does the father's headship gets expressed? Deep unity in the Trinity. There's one will. God the Father is the fountainhead of love, grace, and honor. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's eternally gracious, infinite in glory, and pours out his light and love upon the Son. And the position of the Son in submission receives what the Father has to give. And in this dynamic, you see something powerful that can take place in, in, in the church. When you see the resources, the authority that's been entrusted, not for self-promotion, but as we've been saying throughout the weeks, to use our authority, to lay down our authority, to serve sacrificially with other-centered love and for the glory of God, there is something beautiful that takes place within the church. Michelle Lee Barnwell says this about this passage. There remained hierarchy in the structure even as there might be hierarchy in a traditional family, Jesus called God Father, and his followers were children of God. The members were to live according to the Father's will and to honor him as the divine head of the family. And you also see this in angels, archangels, angels. Hierarchy was also present among Jesus' followers, where status was determined by the length and degree of each person's association with Jesus. Other hierarchies are evident in the church itself, such as the appointment of elders with the possibility of receiving double honor. The Spirit sovereignly distributes gifts so that some are worthy of more honor and are greater. Numerous places in the Gospels speak of those who will be called greater or least in the kingdom of God. The point, now listen, the point is not so much whether hierarchies are present as it is what they mean. She keeps going. In the kingdom, values of power and privilege are turned upside down, and they are upended according to the new values of the kingdom as seen in Christ himself. Christ's statement, such as the last shall be first and the first shall be last, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave to all, are integral to our understanding of hierarchies in the kingdom. The reversal of the hierarchies is a prominent way in which the power of God is displayed in the kingdom as well as a vital means to promote unity in the community. And one of the things that the the early church would talk about is that, you know, in, in, in Greek culture, everything is serving to protect the head. So if there's a fire coming, you thrust your hand into the fire, you're willing to sacrifice an appendage, a hand or an arm to save the head because the head was the, you know, the most important. But only in Christianity, only in the kingdom of God, in Jesus do you have the head sacrificing itself for the body. And that's what true headship is supposed to do. So I believe that the, male, the, the senior pastor ought to be male. That's the headship. Because God to Christ, Christ to the church. And the relationship that that person has to the rest of the church, it sets, and how they handle that authority is to set the pace for the rest of the body. And by the way, the senior pastor also has a head. I have a bishop and I have a board. Everybody has a head. <laughs> we all have a head. But in the days of celebrity pastors, there are far too many examples of the abuse of authority using position and power to engage in self-promotion instead of others-centered love. I believe that the senior pastor ought to use their power and wield their power and authority that's been entrusted to them to lead the sheep in the ways of the Great Commission, to see people come to know Jesus, to feed the sheep with the word of God and through intercessory prayer, to protect the sheep from all erroneous doctrine and teachings and any of the schemes of the evil one that set themselves up against the knowledge of the Holy One, and to have others-centered love in the body of Christ and to use their authority to lay down their authority so is to sacrifice for the body and to glorify King Jesus. And that is to set the pace for the rest of the congregation. That's the fourth point. Fifth point is all of this points to Jesus. Regardless of where you're at, all of this points to Christ. Because Adam, he was a representative of all of humanity. He was the first, first Adam. And he was the first priest in the Garden of Eden, but he failed in his vocation. We have a second Adam, who is Jesus, and he is the great high priest. 
And where Adam the first failed, the second Adam succeeded. And just as Adam couldn't fulfill the creational mandate without Eve, so also the second Adam, Jesus, has invited the second Eve, the church, to co-rule and co-reign with him for the fulfillment of the great commission. And all of this, all of it, is pointing toward a bridal future. When our great God and King, our groom, will rend the heavens and he will come down and we will be wedded to him throughout all of eternity because he is the groom, he is the head of the church, and we are the bride. So all of what we do here points to Jesus. And through it all, I continue to ask that you wrestle with me in this and that we love each other when we're done. Let's pray.